name is Celeste, and in order to explain my questions, I brought a poster. So I'm going to show this to everyone. As you can see, I have only voted for two candidates. Will, it, will would my vote be uh, spoiled if I only voted for two ranked two? This is about uh, ranked voting. With my vote, I'm asking you the question. Would this vote be spoiled if I didn't vote or rank all the parties? When it comes to putting together the um, regulations on what constitutes um, a spoiled ballot, that's something that we have in the past uh, charged um, the, uh, the good people at Elections Canada with uh, thinking about and working on. To the best of my knowledge, Celeste, um, uh, an incomplete ranked ballot, not, never in my experience has that been considered spoiled. Okay, so we yeah. wouldn't be forced to vote for not parties who wouldn't. No. Okay, so my next question, and this is my last. So you've seen that I voted A is one and C is two. Yeah. So this is just a hypothetical first round result. And as you can see, a did not, nobody won a majority. Right. Okay, so this is my ballot. The second, so nobody won, so they'd have to go to a second round. Now, what they do is they take off the candidate who got the fewest votes. So my second choice no longer exists. That is one of the characteristics of the system. So, Absolutely. any of the ranked voting methods, there will be votes that don't count. And right. we want a system where every vote counts. Thank you. It's, um, it's not perfect. Um, and uh, if we're talking about the proposed ranked ballot system, then once a candidate has disappeared, then they can no longer be in contention as anybody's second or subsequent choice. Um, but however, the subsequent choice is very important because then there may be at least some degree of, um, of uh, representation on that basis. Let's move to the first question here. My question is about the single transferable vote, which I understand very well, except how do you decide? Sorry, okay, how's that? It's about the single transferable vote. And what I don't understand it is, uh, the number one got the most, they got more than the cutoff point. How do you decide which of their votes are going to get divided up among the rest of them? Because that will influence the uh, distribution of those transferred votes. I really love your technical and evil question there. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it had to come up at some point, and thank you for starting with that. Um, let me just say, I'll try to be, I'll try to explain this um, as uh, uh, clearly as possible. There are, there are at least two alternatives for that, right? The first alternative is what I would call the arbitrary method, which they use in Ireland. They basically take, the, they skim them off the top, and so it's, uh, it's a bit random. The second method is that. Um, the uh, people who work in the back rooms would actually go and calculate the various proportions that have gone to the other candidates on, the, on those ballots that are surplus um, by, by taking the entire vote for that candidate and then apportion them in that way. That's monumentally long, but it's supremely democratic. Yes. So those are the two alternatives. And, uh, you know, um, the, those who support the single transferable vote would say, in either case, you're getting a better deal than first past the post, but um, that's the way that it, that it might operate. Uh, was that as clear as mud? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, another question here. Um, I'd like to see a show of hands for the Member of Parliament. Who thinks we should have a referendum before this is all changed? And if you say no, could you please explain why? And why is there no question in your questionnaire whether we should have a referendum on this or not? Thank you. I'm happy to uh, yeah. say the floor to the MP. Uh, yeah, yeah. Have you got the mic there? Is there a... 
No, we gave it to Russ. Yeah. Um, one, two. We got one here, right? I'm not saying yes or no yet. I'm not saying no. Uh, but I'm not saying yes. I'm still, I really do want to hear what you have to say. I'd like to change that and ask the audience to, to do that, but I won't. But uh, certainly uh, I'll be interested to see how many people here think that we should have a referendum. I am 100% behind a referendum. The reason I have to say that is that at the end of the day, even today, it is wonderful to see so many people out here today, but I recognize that it's still a uh, about 0.01 or 0.02 percent of the population where we're looking at 460,000 people or so. So I think in order to hear from all Canadians, not all Canadians are coming out to town halls, so I think it's important that we do hear from all Canadians through a referendum. Thank you. I have profound concerns about uh, referenda. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to uh, communicate um, uh, a number of complicated issues and I think Brexit tells us that you can get into some very, very difficult territory. So, um, uh, no, I, um, I, don't, uh, I don't think uh, a referendum would serve as well. I understand and respect the concerns of those who have raised uh, the idea of a referendum. I want to continue to listen to those perspectives. But like Irene, I have concerns about referendum as well. Uh, concerns that she has pointed to, but I would also add that when we've made profound changes to our electoral system in the past, these did not come by way of referendum. I'm thinking specifically of women, when women were given the vote, and I'm th thinking specifically of when First Nations peoples were given the vote. That did not, that did not come through a referendum. So that's, that's my view on that. Thank you very much. And let's go to another question over here. Hello, my name is Chris. I have a question about mixed member proportional, which is nicely up on the screen there. So, uh, if we keep the writings the size they are now, and uh, the votes the way they are now, then where are all these pop-up seats going to go? I mean, the House of Commons is pretty full from what I can tell. So, how many more seats are we looking at adding to the Parliament here, or are we talking about increasing the size of our uh, writings instead, decreasing the number we actually elect, and then to make way for these top-up candidates? Great, good question, and thank you very much for that. I mean, I think the answer to that is, is exactly the kind of, uh, or begins in exactly the kind of consulting process that we have today, which is to say, um, you know, how, um, how many um, MPs would we like to see in, um, in a, perhaps in a large house uh, in order to accommodate some degree of um, proportionality. Uh, what would be the consequences of that? Where would you put the boundaries? Uh, who would be uh, involved in the process of creating the boundaries? Would it stay as a sort of neutral boundary kind of um, allocation system? Would that, would that, is there any danger that that might be politicized? Um, those are the sorts of questions that we would need to ask. I don't think there's a, there's a fixed answer to it, um, but I certainly do think that if you're moving to an, an MMP system, you're going to be making some bold changes in one way or another. I even heard a, a few years ago um, people suggest that um, it might be an idea to perhaps uh, you know, combine uh, getting rid of the Senate with adding 100 proportional seats to the House of Commons. Um, which is a, an interesting thing. I'm not advocating it, I'm not here. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <advocating. laughs> have to be so careful with this, you know. <laughs> but I love them. You would agree that the, uh, either the number of seats has to increase or the size of the writings has, has to increase? To be able well, the, to the existing writings could stay the way they are, yeah. um, but you would, need, you would need to create regions. And the question is what those regions would be and, and how you would make those meaningful. Can I just say, you know, more seriously, one of the challenges we have in Canada is the disproportionality of our writings. We've got some very, very large, especially rural writings, we, we saw it on the map, um, where it's going to be difficult to create, especially in the north, it's going to be difficult to create regions. So some people have said, well, why don't we come up with a system, an MMP system, that kind of gives that, um, gives that proportionality and that uh, top-up to, say, the 
um, urban parts of Canada and the suburban parts, but, but retains the kind of existing system for the remainder of the country. So there's all kinds of solutions, and I hope some of those will be discussed in your focus groups today. Thank you. And let's please move to the next question. Uh, yeah, I've been witnessing to a form of a question. Uh, one thing I'm noticing here today, and one thing I'm very concerned about uh, with any new system, no matter how good the system is, uh, the fact that media can sometimes uh, play a huge factor in manipulating things. One good thing about this, I do like that it actually forces people to actually look at all party platforms and kind of gets them out of the uh, mindset of, oh, we voted this way, I'm going to do it this way. Uh, but how, uh, whereabouts <coughs> does the government sit on pol uh, the political influence that media represents? And it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty drastic one. Can I just say that, I mean, I think, would you like to speak to this? Yeah. I, I was just going to say very briefly, I, I really appreciate the question about the media because I think in, in the transition from any, um, in any electoral system change, if we're considering change, the media have a really serious responsibility. And that is to make sure that all the information is, is conveyed in, in, as, in as neutral and as informative a way as possible so the citizens can make up their mind. Mm -hmm. I don't think the media have done a good job in the past in Canada, to be frank with you. Um, I think the media have not done that well. Um, and as a consequence of that, I think we've had flawed consultation systems in the past. So I'm really pleased you raised that. Uh, but members of parliament, please. I, I, I agree with, uh, with Paul's comments entirely. As for the government's position, the media are independent and will report on this in, in, in a way that they wish. Uh, we can't control what the media says. Uh, but of course, yes, I, I take the point seriously that uh, the way that the media decides to report on electoral reform, the way that the media decides to report on any issue will inevitably create certain public perceptions of that issue. Uh, but it's incumbent on us to control what we can, can uh, control, and that is to uh, organize public consultations where views can be put forward so that we can report back to Parliament. Let's move to a question here. This isn't so much a question as just uh, some comments. First of all, there seems to be a general assumption that we're going to have parties. And I have a huge problem with parties. There's, um, it accumulates power in fewer hands. The members often end up doing what the party tells them to. People who are not in a mainline party have a definite uh, problem in as far as funding and so on is much harder to come by if you don't have a party organization backing you. Um, so uh, that's my comments on parties. Thank you. Um, a lot of people talk about the lack of uh, the, the number of people, especially younger people who don't vote. Um, most of my friends are much younger than me. Most of them don't vote. I don't vote. Um, I just consider the whole process totally irrelevant to me. I don't trust any of you people. Um, I did run in a provincial election, uh, the last provincial election actually. I was co-founder of the None of the Above Party. And the main thing there, I wasn't trying to get elected. Um, I just wanted to point out the holes in everybody else's uh, arguments, but at the various um, all candidate meetings, never anybody under 30 unless somebody brought their kid along with them. Um, and Well, thank, thank you very much, sir. I mean, you've, you've raised two really important points that I think we could talk about for, for a long time. Can I just say very briefly on, on the first one, there are, and I hope I pointed this out, there are electoral systems that really do advantage uh, the uh, individuals as opposed to the parties. And, um, I think that it's up to us to think about how we want to uh, de-emphasize, if that's our goal, the political party's role in reframing the electoral systems. And the single transferable vote is the obvious example. I haven't heard it raised here, so I'm going to raise it now. Uh, Peter, in your opening statement, you talked about this being the potential last first past the post, which is not what the, uh, the party platform was. So how do we ensure that what your party has 
put forward is what we're actually going to get. I understand we're having consultations for that, but that word potential in there really uh, is fearful for me. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question. As far as my comment goes, I'm glad you asked it because it, uh, this is a, a nuanced, complicated debate. Uh, it will require a report to be put forward, and from there we will examine the report and see the mechanisms around what, um, what a change could entail and how quickly a change could be brought forward. I do believe that we can um, have the next election as the first election where first past the post is not in place, but it will require close coordination. It will require making sure that Elections Canada is able to do that work. And so the word potential is in there for that reason. But when you look at the party platform, you're quite right. It's exactly what it says. Uh, this will be, in the 2019 will be the first election where first past the post is not in place. And I, I believe that we can uh, continue with that uh, vision in mind, but there are complications, there are nuances to all of this, and it would be uh, remiss of me not to, uh, not to touch on that point. Thank you very much. And um, at this stage, um, there are remaining questions. I can see people at the microphones, but we are... Um, I really would at, like at to say this question because I hasn't. I don't think this has been yeah, said, and yeah, I'm unfortunately we we run well, out of time. I, I also, and and so uh, what we can do now why not call is we're going to New Zealand approach to electoral reform. Uh, you know, in 2019, why not include two independent questions? Do you want to get rid of first past the post, and which four alternatives do you prefer? Could be the second one. If, like New Zealanders, a majority of Canadians want to change the electoral system then a 2020 referendum would be held in which the electorate chooses between first past the post and the preferred alternative. Canadians, you can tell by this, this is moving way too fast. And the hubris of the liberals to say this is the last, you had 39.5% of the popular vote. That wasn't a mandate for Mr. Harper when he had 39.6% of the popular okay, vote. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you now, please. And just so like I'm just going to say, you very much. one more thing is just in no, no, please, do, do now sit down. Away, Thank you very much. Do now please sit down. If only, Thank you very much. Only if the majority Can you move that microphone? Thank you, is that possible? Thank you. I'm sorry, this is a great opportunity for me perhaps to remind us that what we're here to do today is to uh, give our point of view by all means. There's going to be plenty of time in the focus group sessions. But to bear in mind that we do have a process set up and to be very mindful to listen to each other, to pay attention to what each other is saying, and uh, to pay attention to the process.